Okay, hello everyone. Thank you all very much for coming out to my talk today uh, on this Sunday afternoon. I want to say thank you very much to the Hope people for having me out here. It's a tremendous honor of mine to be speaking up here on the stage under the banner of a conference, um, which so many people whom I respect and admire tremendously have spoken at or are speaking at now. This talk is Tor, the Dark Arts of Attack and Defense. We're going to be talking about some practical attacks on the Tor ecosystem as well as some uh, defensive measures that operators can take. I'm EOF or uh, into file if you're not into the whole brevity thing. My real name's Hunter. That's just my mundane name. It doesn't matter what the hell you call me. You can call me Susan if it makes you happy. Um, actually, don't do that. That's a little kinky for me. Um, but who the hell am I? Why should you care what I have to say? I'm basically just some random guy. Um, I'm not affiliated with the Tor project in any way. I really respect the work that they do. I just don't have anything to do with them. Uh, my background is in pen testing, security research, um, NetSec, sysadmin type stuff. Um, I I'm a, consider myself a hacker. I think it's important to clarify what I mean when I say that because I think, unfortunately, that term has been distorted and perverted not only in the media but in the cybersecurity industry. When I say I, I'm a hacker, I mean that I'm someone who enjoys playful cleverness. Um, I like asking questions and refusing to stop asking them. I mean, you could ask 10 different people what does being a hacker mean, you'd probably get 12 different answers. But I put it as a separate point because um, being a hacker has absolutely fucking nothing to do with what your job title is or what letters you have after your name. So why would I want to give this talk? Well, I think that fundamentally speaking, I think that the freedoms of privacy, freedom of expression online, anonymity, so on and so forth, these are more than just online rights. I think that they're fundamental human rights. Um, but a right is not a right if someone can take it away from you. So rights stay our rights by virtue of our ability to defend those rights. Um, and some of the ways that you can defend your rights against the surveillance machine is by using software like Tor. But using software is not necessarily enough because just as you would seek to exercise your rights, there are entities out there that would seek to subvert those rights. So you need to understand the security of the software that you're using and understand how to use it in a secure way. Um, I also want to give this talk to showcase some examples to help maybe inspire further security research on the Tor ecosystem. A brief outline of some of the things we're going to be talking about. I presume that if you're here today and you're at this talk, you probably have at least a basic level of understanding of what Tor is and how it kind of works. So we'll just do a brief um, overview of how it functions, talk about some of the limitations of it, um, some of the motivations an attacker might have, explore some of the different components of the network ecosystem that you might target for attack, uh, take a quick look at a couple case studies in recent years, and finally wrap things up with some defensive measures. What this talk is not, I just want to get this out of the way straight up. There's no Tor O'Day here today, guys. Sorry if you came out here for that. Um, I'm not going to be talking about cracking encryption, not a lot of spy thriller stuff. I know sometimes certain media outlets like to sensationalize uh, stories involving privacy and encryption with <laughs> narratives about espionage, which is useful sometimes, but that's just not what this is. And uh, try to limit the discussion about the uh, dark web, deep web, deep net, dark net, whatever the hell you want to call it. Uh, unfortunately, when looking um, at practical examples of Tor security, there's not a lot of other places to look, so we do have to look at it a little bit. So just a very brief overview. As I say, I assume everybody here is probably at least basically familiar with it. How does Tor work? This is a slide which you may have seen before depicting um, a Tor connection to a just a basic site on the internet. You have the, the client initiates the connection uh, to an entry guard. It's then forwarded through some hops. There's some encapsulation and encryption before it gets spat out the other end and then eventually comes back through the same circuit. Um, the way it functions is encapsulating these, like the layers of an onion, so that um, none of the nodes can see what the actual content is or know uh, the originating source. Um, onion services are a little more complicated in how they work. Just a very, very high-level overview of how they function. Um, you have an onion service that chooses a series of entry points. It then publishes these to a descriptor. When a user tries to access that uh, Onion service, they retrieve the descriptor from the distributed hash table, initiate a connection to the rendezvous point, and then utilize that uh, channel for communication. Why would an attacker target uh, the Onion ecosystem? 
There are a few different reasons. Obviously, data theft in the case of um, onion services that are maybe, for example, uh, illegal marketplaces that are dealing with high levels of cryptocurrency, they may be motivated to steal cryptocurrency or steal uh, other data. Um, recovering metadata, targeting nodes or things like that to see what connections were made to this host, from where, when, for how long. Spying on communications, um, just trying to see what the operators are doing, who they're talking to, what they're talking about. Law enforcement, law enforcement may have legitimate cause to target um, onion services and users in the case of child abuse material and so forth. Um, defacement, sometimes you see that. Uh, competing services in the um, ecosystem will, you know, hack one and put it in, uh, you know, hacked by elite hacks or squad or whatever. Um, furthering additional attacks, so network level attacks or um, taking over an onion service to try to target the users. And of course, the traditional kinds of things we always see, like dissemination of spam, malware, botnets, denial of service. Some of the things that Tor cannot protect you from, um, it cannot protect you from what's called a global passive adversary, or if you have someone that can see everything coming in and out of the network, it can't protect you from that. It can't protect you from malware on your workstation. That maybe seems obvious to people in this room, but I've seen a lot of questions about that online. If you have a keylogger on your machine, it doesn't really matter if what you're sending out is encrypted if some attacker is stealing it before it even gets sent. It can't protect you from the Borg. You will be assimilated if you encounter the Borg. And it cannot protect you from yourself, which um, seems kind of silly, but if you're using it in an irresponsible way, you're, you're going to mess up and you're going to get de-anonymized or worse. So a brief overview of network level attacks. Um, in researching this, I found that a lot of network level attacks have been researched really thoroughly. And they're absolutely awesome, and they're definitely worth researching. Um, but due to time constraints, I couldn't do a deep dive in any of these. They basically function around a couple of different strategies, um, different kinds of correlation attacks, trying to correlate data coming out of the network with the data that was sent in, or vice versa, um, performing analysis on it, and so forth, discovering the entry point of a user or an onion service to try to uh, uncover you know, where it originated, Timing attacks, um, attacks by putting a lot of malicious nodes on the network to further other attacks. Men in the middle in the case of like malicious exit relays. Um, and of course, denial of service. Fingerprinting, looking for ways in which a service is unique or that its, its network stack is unique, things that are unique to it that can be used to help you de-anonymize it. And then of course, good old fashioned exploits. I mean, um, it, you know, owning a service in the hidden service or um, uh, an exploit against the Tor service itself. Attacking the browser. So browsers, browsers make a very attractive target for an attacker because they provide a very large attack surface. Um, if you consider all of the things that a modern web browser does, there's a lot of intricate moving parts and sometimes they're quite delicate. Um, the interesting thing about the fundamental technologies of the web is that they weren't really designed with privacy and anonymity in mind. If you consider when you use a regular web browser to go to a site, it's perfectly ordinary that the site knows where that connection originated. Um, in the case of Tor, though, that could be a really serious problem if the site knows where the request originated. So uh, there's this interesting additional, I don't know what you'd call it, attack surface of not just traditional browser-based attacks, but actually inducing the browser to maybe make a request, something as simple as that, that doesn't use Tor, or uh, get, give it to give up some kind of information that's unique to it or fingerprintable. Um, and JavaScript. JavaScript is a horrible abomination from the beyond. It's, con it's caused untold misery and sorrow. Um, uh, some of the more recent uh, Tor browser exploits that I came across utilized JavaScript. Um, JavaScript is attractive for attackers because it makes it easy to do things like heap spraying. Um, there were a couple of exploits that were linked to law enforcement. But it's not just about memory corruption and code execution. There are other things as well. Um, things like using JavaScript to glean information from a browser that's unique to that browser or unique to the system on which it's running. Um, and then JavaScript injection, not just talking about like cross-site scripting, for example, but injecting JavaScript um, through a malicious relay. JavaScript is not the only culprit, though, and um, disabling JavaScript is not a cure-all. There have been some interesting attacks that have not used JavaScript in the past. There was um, an attack in 2017 that was called Tormoil, basically um, using a file URL 
causes an IP address leak. There's an interesting bug that I think only affected really limited versions of the browser in like a specific time frame, but it's still interesting to think about an attack outside of the traditional attack model we think about in browsers. Essentially, it was um, possible to, if you operated a malicious relay, uh, exit relay, and you had a spoofed or valid TLS cert for addons.mozilla.org, um, you could spoof the response back to the browser's auto-update and get it to download a malicious extension. So it's kind of an interesting attack. Um, attacking Onion services and infrastructure, you know, there's really nothing magical or special about them. Um, just following a pen testing methodology, looking for misconfigurations, looking for unique identifiers, things like um, service banners, uh, HTTP headers, things like that that you could plug into Shodan and search for and uncover. And there was one interesting case I came across. I can't remember the name of the market. It was, it was an illegal market that had decided it would be a good idea to put the name of their illegal market in the HTTP response header. Um, so someone searched for that on Shodan and uncovered the real IP. And I don't know what happened to those guys, but that's an example of a bad idea. If it's running as a web application, I mean, look for basic things like your OWASP top 10 type bugs, injection, you know, that kind of stuff. And also keep in mind that your end goal may not necessarily be remote code execution, perhaps maybe just inducing the service to initiate a request that doesn't use Tor might be enough. And there are tools like Onion Scan uh, that can perform some real basic scanning to look for low-hanging fruit and things like that. Attacking the user. Um, those of you who work in security probably know that the weakest, the weakest link in the security chain is usually the user, unfortunately. Um, a lot of attacks that we've seen on users in the Tor ecosystem kind of fall under the umbrella of social engineering. Things like phishing, again, in the case of darknet markets and so forth. Um, cloning, cloning an Onion service, just creating a copycat, maybe even um, you know, creating a lookalike hash with something like Scallion to have it look more legitimate and induce people to visit it. An interesting thing about um, Onion addresses is that they ignore everything to the left, so you could have like, you know, the first several uh, characters mimic a legitimate Onion service, but it's actually your evil as fuck Onion service. And somebody not paying attention might not notice that. Um, things like malicious files, getting people to download files and execute them outside of Tor, and then threading together OPSEC failures. Um, particularly in anonymous communities, maybe you're targeting an individual user, just looking at ways in which this uh, person has made OPSEC mistakes or spoken about themselves or other things that you can kind of piece together to either begin de-anonymizing them or gain enough information so that when you finally do uncover them, you have a case against them. Some interesting case studies. So each one of these could probably fill a talk in and of itself. And um, there have been a lot of talks about these. Silk Road it happened like 300 years ago, I think. But essentially, uh, the operator of Silk Road, Ross Ulbricht, um, made a couple of careless OPSEC mistakes. He associated um, handles he had used previously with his Onion operations. Um, the FBI was able to get the uh, Silk Road service to give up its real IP through some mechanism. It's disputed how they actually did it. But basically, with all of that, they were able to build a case, and he's on prison. Um, operation Anonymous was another uh, law enforcement operation against darknet markets. They took down Silk Road 2.0, among others. At the time, there was some speculation that it was like some kind of conspiracy or like uh, the FBI had hired a university to do it. Not really sure what happened. I mean, and at the time they said, that, like the FBI said that they had cracked like 400 services or something like that. And it was really far, far less. I think it was something like 27. And that's actually something that they do is they purposefully spread fear and uncertainty and doubt about the network and try to undermine it. Um, as in the case of Operation Bayonet. So, um, Alpha Bay was another illegal market. It was operated by a Canadian guy in, I think, Thailand. Um, he had also made some critical OPSEC mistakes that ultimately cost him his life. He had associated email addresses and handles and things like that with his uh, illegal marketplace. Um, when the police came to his house, they said that he was actually had the site up and was administrating it at that very moment. They also found um, 
documents with like his illegal proceeds and things like that in it. And once that was shut down, um, a lot of people fled to another competing market. But what they didn't know was that um, law enforcement had actually already infiltrated it. And they had done a, a number of things like um, induce users to download like a, a transaction summary that was actually a malic malicious Excel document. Um, they had done things like um, put backdoors in the encrypted chat so that you know you thought you were sending a PGP chat, but it was actually plain, being logged as plain text. Excuse me. Um, they like deleted all the images to try to get people to re-upload them so they could steal EXIF data. A lot of things like that, and it's actually part of their ongoing strategy to try to you know, as I said, spread fear, make people think that Tor is broken or something like that, which I think is, is shitty of them to do, but I think it goes to show that they don't have some magic spell they can cast to just de-anonymize anything, or they probably wouldn't have to do that, in my opinion. Um, there are a couple of other things, um, Operation Torpedo and Operation Pacifier. Uh, these were operations against Onion services that were um, child abuse sites. Essentially, the FBI took them over and deployed what they called a NIT, they really love those acronyms, right? Uh, it was a network investigative tool technique, basically what we would call an exploit um, that delivered malware that induced the user's uh, computer to make a request outside of the network and reveal their true IP address. Um, Freedom Hosting was another, was another site. This was a um, service for hosting Onion services. Uh, it was attacked in a similar fashion. The, uh, the feds used it to distribute malware in a similar way. Freedom Hosting 2 was another, again, hosting service. Um, in that case, I believe it was just a vigilante hacker took it over, and they didn't use any kind of magic exploits or anything like that. If you go and actually read the write-up of what they did, which you can find online, they did a step-by-step, -step. it's really just basic Unix privilege escalation. Um, kind of, you know, exploding misconfigurations, um, symlink bypasses, and things like that. So getting into some defensive measures. Um, hardening your onion, I mean, really basic server hardening gets you a long way. Um, you know, removing unneeded services, hardening your logins, actually patching, disabling things you don't need, um, like directory listing server status, uh, only listening on local hosts, removing any kind of unique identifiers like uh, banners, service versions, uh, server headers, things like that that might be unique. Protecting the keys um, so that people who steal them can't identify you. Um, only routing Tor traffic. Isolating. Um, consider using like an isolating proxy or something like that. Avoiding leaks like DNS lookups or other kinds of protocol leaks that you might not think about. Actually monitor it. You know, um, see what's going on under the hood. Make sure you understand what's happening on your service. Uh, consider using Unix sockets and, and to avoid TCP or running um, the service in a CH root. And of course, actually actually test it once you get it set up. I mean, if you're not a security person, find a friend who is and ask them to look at it for you. Um, security with the Tor browser is pretty straightforward. I mean, you want to use strict security settings, disable JavaScript. Unfortunately, I know that breaks a lot of websites. Um, there are a lot of people out there that write sites that need like 100 megs of JavaScript just to render a fucking news article. But um, if you're doing things that might jeopardize your freedom, that's something that you need to accept. And yes, there are trade-offs. It's inconvenient, but it's more secure. Uh, don't mix your anonymous and your non-anonymous activity. Don't use Tour Browser to go to some website um, you know, where you're known under an alias, post there and talk about stuff, and then come back to it under you know, a regular browser. Be careful what you download over Tor. Don't download something, you know, sketchy and then run it. You, know, you could get exploited. Have, have common sense, basically. And I know common sense isn't so common, but a little bit goes a long way. Some advanced techniques, not really actually so advanced, um, but using Tails, something like Tails. Tails is um, a live USB system. You could just plug it in, boot it up, and everything is going over Tor. Um, you could configure a transparent proxy of your own if you'd like. You could also use an isolating proxy, something that's, or, or physical isolation, and even to actually force everything through Tor in a separate uh, exterior node. Um, dump your own traffic and check it. You know, if, once you set these things up, don't just blindly trust that it's going to work. Actually, you know, run something and look at the traffic, perform requests, try to uh, 
induce requests that you might not have thought about to get it to make requests outside of Tor. Just test, test it yourself. Set up a passive tap or something. If that sounds like too much work for you, you should really reconsider whatever it is that you're using that to do. Because if it's something that's going to jeopardize your freedom, it's worth the extra work. Uh, there are a number of trade-offs. I mean, um, there are a lot of different things you can do. This is from the Hoonix website. Love Hoonix. Great, great stuff. But depending on you know what configuration you have, there are a number of different considerations to take into account. Um, some of them protect you from some things and don't from others. I mean, it, it really just depends on your own needs and the level of security um, that's required for what you're doing. Operational security. So, <laughs> operational security. I think kind of gets brushed aside a lot because we kind of take it for granted. We all think like, oh, I'm smart, I know what I'm doing. There's famous last words. And I think that it's been shown that a number of people who were you know, quite successful at doing bad things probably thought they were untouchable and they ultimately got caught due to operational security mistakes. So the rule zero, the cardinal rule of OPSEC, if you ask me to boil everything down into one thing, it's shut the fuck up. I mean, that's pretty straightforward. Don't, don't, just, just don't, just don't. Uh, but no, but don't talk to people about th things that you're doing that could jeopardize your freedom. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've had total strangers come up to me like at a security conference and start telling me uh, about things that they're doing that maybe could jeopardize their freedom and it's not a good idea to do that. And don't reveal operational information. Um, this is an interesting one. You don't want to talk about it, like in the case of anonymous um, communities and things like that, you don't want to talk about things that you have done, things that you are doing, or things that you intend to do. And you also don't want to talk about what you're using. Don't tell people what software you use, what versions you use, you know, um, what your configuration is. That's just giving them more information to target you. Um, trust no one. Don't trust me, certainly. Um, but really, don't trust anybody on there. I mean, your friends in IRC are not going to go to jail for you. So don't trust them. I mean, don't trust the hidden service that you're visiting. For all you know, it could have been owned by law enforcement or you know, it could have been owned by some kind of oppressive regime or something like that. Um, don't, mix, don't mix business and pleasure. If your activity that you're engaging in is something that is vocational, then you need to treat it with a degree of professionalism and recognize it as that. And don't start doing it for fun. Um, if you use drugs or alcohol, you know, don't go do it while you're under the influence because you're going to get sloppy and you're going to make a mistake. Um, don't work from home. This is an interesting one. Um, you know, there have been cases where, okay, so you're using Tor and we can't see what's going on, but let's say that we're investigating you and, you know, it can be seen that, okay, this person at this house is connected to Tor at this time, and this alias is active in this IRC at this time. And there have been cases where that's actually happened. Uh, be paranoid. I mean, again, that's just a, a big rule. It's just you have to be paranoid. In fact, I think the Grug put it best when he said you have to be proactively paranoid. Paranoia does not work retroactively. What's interesting about operational security is if, if you're conducting operations, you have to take on the role of a defender. And if you're in security, you understand how hard that actually is. Because the attacker, they just need you to make one mistake. They just need you to screw up one time. And that's really hard to not do. So you need to be paranoid. Compartmentalize, not just from a technological point of view, putting things that are, you know, that you're using for anonymous activity separate in separate machines, um, and so on and so forth. That way you don't, like, accidentally forget to enable Tor when you connect to that IRC server that one time. Um, but also compartmentalize your life. I mean, if you're engaging in activity that could jeopardize your freedom, and I'm not just talking about doing illegal stuff. I'm talking about if you're, if you're a, a leaker or a journalist or something like that, you, you want to keep that part of your identity separate from your real identity so that it's not uh, correlated. Keep a clean house. Um, you know, don't leave things lying around that could incriminate you. Um, the Canadian guy in Thailand, you know, they show up, he's got my uh, illegal drug money on it, you know, in an Excel doc. I mean, or if you're a journalist or a leaker and you've got documents that are really going to piss some people off, maybe don't just leave them lying on your desk. Don't talk to the police. Uh, I hope that goes without saying. The police are not your friends. They're not there to help you. They're going to lie to you. And they're going to try to get you to incriminate yourself. So never, never talk to the police. I'm not a lawyer. Um, if you need a lawyer, go get one, because I'm not one. 
but a basic rule is don't talk to them. If they try to get you to talk to them, demand a lawyer. And finally, don't, give, don't get in a situation where other people have got uh, power over you or are able to blackmail you in some way or get you to take risks for them. And finally, uh, surveillance self-defense. So this is the NSA logo. Um, surveillance self-defense is, is kind of a tricky thing because it's easy to make recommendations about, oh, you know, use Signal, use Tor, but I don't think that that actually solves the problem, and I'm not saying that people shouldn't do that, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't write that kind of software. That's absolutely an incredible thing to do, and I have a lot of respect for the people that do it, um, but I think fundamentally we have to understand that surveillance isn't going away right now. It's actually it seems to have gotten much worse, at least here in the United States, uh, in my recent memory, and I don't know um, that writing blog posts is gonna fix it. So I think that what we need to do, um, or if you really, really wanna piss them off, what you actually have to do is organize, like politically organize. Um, not just like disparate things and you know writing your congressman, I mean, that's important, don't get me wrong, but I think actual political organization is one of the things that's going to have to happen for surveillance to stop at a fundamental level. Um, now, I'm not like a political activist or an organizer, so don't ask me how we do that. I don't have all the answers I did, but I see that as really the only way that it's gonna go away. So I'm actually like really under time here, uh, and I appreciate everybody coming out. Um, thanks to the Tor Project for all the work that you guys do. Uh, thanks for all the prior researchers. I'm really standing on the shoulders of giants with this. There's gonna be a companion right up to this uh, soonish whenever I stop being lazy and put it up. If you want to stalk me on Twitter, go ahead. Um, otherwise, I think we have some time uh, for questions. So if anyone would like to ask a question, be my guest. So thanks. Uh, thanks for coming out and giving this talk. Um, I'm curious on the client side, the Tor client side of hardening things, mm -hmm. if this would be overkill, or if have anyone has ever done any research into um, writing SE Linux policies for Firefox um, as a part of, you know, Tails or some kind of distribution that would um, give a little more of a, you know, mandatory access control kind of level of security around the Tor. Because you, you have those zero days, and it seems like some of those exploits relied on things that we could stop with SE Linux, even with the zero day president. Have you heard any talk about people trying to use SE Linux or some other mandatory access control system to help fix sure, that? Sure, sure. Uh, so yes, I have seen things about that online. Um, I think that's a great idea. I would definitely love to see some stuff about that. Um, one of the things that I see a lot is, like I said, isolating proxies so that in the event of like a, an exploit against the browser, those requests can't actually exit the network like because they're isolated um, physically. Um, but I think that's actually a, that's an awesome idea. I'd love to see more about that. I, I, I have a question about uh, an, an attack on the hidden, uh, on the uh, onion itself. Um, I, I am aware that the uh, V2 onions are, are based on RSA uh, 1024, uh, which would be somewhat short uh, if uh, you consider like nation state actors. Uh, ha do you have any evidence that anybody has actually um, just uh, brute forced uh, a V2 to, uh, RSA 1024 based onion? Uh, and if you do, um, would you know approximately how much computing power we're looking with and how many, how many GPUs? Um, no, I don't. Uh, or G GPU hours, I'd say. Yeah, okay. um, I'm not aware of that. Um, I'm not aware of that. I, I don't think that that's been done. I haven't seen any evidence that's been done. Um, and I, I'm not a crypto person, so I wouldn't be able to tell you like how long it would take. Uh, okay, that's, it's, you don't need to be a crypto person. It's just if you're like a system engineer or admin and you just kind of a v vague idea on like kind of hash rate and you know and hash rate of cards and, and how many you can shove into uh, like a 4U rack and then how many 4U racks you have in a cabinet and how many cabinets you can have in a data center. And yeah, um, no, I'm sorry, I actually, I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, 
I wish I did. Uh, I would definitely say to look into that. I'm sure there's. I'm sure that there are people who have uh, put in documentation together on that. So I would look online for that. But I don't have that answer. All right. Thank you. Hi there. Thank you. I have uh, two questions in slightly different areas. Uh, you know, you talked about um, the, the evidence of user-based attacks being really common by law enforcement, sort of as an indication that maybe the network has not been as broken as I want everyone to think. Is it possible that there's evidence of this breakage, but it's you know been sealed away from you know public documentation? I don't know. I mean, yeah, what the hell? Maybe they're playing, playing like four-dimensional chess or something. I mean, <laughs> I mean, if you've ever seen The Wire, there's the idea that. They're doing the the wiretapping illegally. And yeah, absolutely, absolutely. No, I, I um, kidding aside. Seriously, I, that is something that's crossed my mind. I, I don't really know the answer to that. Um, no. I, what I will say is that I don't know. To my knowledge, I have not seen any evidence that there is, like I say, some magic spell that law enforcement can cast to de-anonymize services. Um, I think if such a thing existed. Someone would have found it, although maybe not. But uh, no, to my knowledge, there's no evidence that that's what's going on. And thanks. And also, I was curious if you've ever seen a project, or maybe know the feasibility of a project that would heuristically analyze your, um, you know, your your proxy traffic and look for leakages that you would would otherwise be, uh, you know, fatal in terms of privacy. No, I have not actually. Uh, does such a thing exist? I I don't know. I'm curious if anyone's worked on it. Which Anyone? One? Rep. Rep. Yeah, grep. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, no, I, I, that's not something I found. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Hey, pardon me if this is a noob question, but I was just curious. At the bottom of one of your slides, it said to run into root. What, uh, <laughs> can you provide a little more technical reason of why that's more secure? Sure, so like um, a shroot, for example, um, in the case that like the service gets exploited, it kind of limits what's possible to be done from there. Um, I can get you some more information about that if you want to get with me afterwards. I could give you some links to how that all works. Yeah, sure, thank you. Any thoughts on comparing Tor to I2P? Um, compare and contrast? Okay, yeah, um, well I2P, actually I have not looked at it that much. Um, I am aware of it, I kind of know what it does, but it's not something I've actually researched a tremendous amount. Um, so I wouldn't really be able to tell you that. Okay, I think that's it, unless anybody else has anything. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>